Evelyn Cameron's story is one of many women's stories that complete our state's history. Yet Evelyn's story may be unique in that she left a legacy of photographs and diaries detailing life from 1894 to 1928 on her ranch just outside of Terry, Montana. And they can all, all of the diaries and the photographs, or most of them, can be accessed at the Historical Society archives as well as the museum in Terry, Montana. There are quite a, a number of photographs there. So I want you to imagine yourself now, tonight, you're in Evelyn's house, in her ranch house, you're sitting uh, having some tea with Evelyn, and you have inquired about her life. She knew you were coming, so she prepared herself by getting some excerpts from her diaries and letters to refer to. She's about to tell you how she came to Montana from England at the turn of that last century. My script is based on Donna Lucy's book, Photographing Montana, and my research in Evelyn's diaries. But keep in mind, Evelyn was a very private person, and so are diaries. There are things she wouldn't divulge to you that she did, of course, in her diary. She wouldn't, for instance, complain about her younger brother, Alec, who lived with them for seven years. Seven long years. <laughs> she wrote about Alec in her diary. I believe the Lord was called away when costing Alec's cranium and left the brains out. <laughs> and there are some things she wouldn't even tell you in her diary, a secret that only she and Ewan shared. I can tell you that it involves a marriage certificate or a lack of one, but that's for another program. I have found in my own research of Evelyn's diaries and letters and by performing Evelyn for the uh, Humanities Montana Speaker Bureau for a number of years, I let her get under my skin and I know that although Ewan was a source of exasperation to her, he was a gentleman farmer who wanted to be a scholar and leave all the ranch work to me. But I do know this, Evelyn was fond of him and he of her. So I hope that I can introduce Evelyn to you in an authentic way and I hope she approves. And I think I, I did. When I first did Evelyn in Terry, Montana, I was about five or 10 minutes into the show and an elderly gentleman got up and walked out. He told the cook on the way out, you know, I knew Evelyn when I was eight years old. I didn't like her then and I don't like her now. <laughs> well, where to start? Uh, I suppose, uh, England. My family expected me to grow old, as it were, in England, as they had done for generations. But my husband and I, lured by the, the propaganda, the advertisement of the day, extolling the virtues of the American West, shared a dream of going to Montana. And so we did. But I have to say that my family disapproved of that adventure from the very beginning, as well as my husband, Ewan Cameron. I suppose looking back on it now, I can understand reasons for their hesitancy. You see, I was only 21 and he 36. But I do think an even larger worry must have been the differences in our temperaments, the contrast of his scholarly and solitary ways with my social and rather independent manner was as obvious to them as it was quite immaterial to me. You see, I have a bit of the British temperament. I'm easygoing and confiding. But when put on the defensive for a righteous cause, I would fight to the last ditch. And uh, my family saw that you and I just might reach loggerheads over certain issues. Well, in addition to that, uh, Ewan's family wealth was about gone due to poor management. His health was not always good, so 
My family elected to send us a stipend of 300 pounds per year to protect us from our baseless optimism of ranching in Montana. I have to say that the work was indeed hard. The recreation was quite rare. But as I explained in a letter that I wrote to a niece of mine, she had written and inquired as to how many servants we had working on our ranch. And I told her that I preferred being uh, independent of hired help. I told her that a woman too fond of society would certainly be out of her element in eastern Montana. Manual labor is all I really care about. After all, it's what makes a woman strong. I mean, I, I really do enjoy gentling a horse and training it, uh, milking a, a cow or branding, even chopping down trees. You know, Ewan's nature studies were of the utmost importance to him. He was an ornithologist by trade. It's all that ever really mattered to him. So I suppose we made a good match after all, for, for it was the daily operations of the ranch that held my attention, that and my photography. Well, we arrived in the fall of 1889. Montana had just become a state, and we had just become pioneers. Uh, it was a most unfortunate time, however, for you see it was just three years after what experts called the rush of money and livestock into eastern Montana. It all ended with that dreadful winter of 86-87. Uh, but despite the poor economic conditions and our rather uh, reckless optimism, we set out to make plans to obtain our wealth. Plan number one, we decided that we would raise thoroughbred horses uh, in Montana for the purposes of polo. And then we would sell those horses to uh, wealthy gentlemen in England. But I'm afraid our plan took a turn for the worse from the very beginning. Uh, well, uh, First, a, a check was dished, and we were given a $1,000 fine and a threatened foreclosure by the banker, Harry Batchelor, uh, in Miles City. We eventually settled that affair. But then the panic of 1893 threw the entire nation into an economic depression. And it was at that point we lost most of our money when the Stock Growers National Bank in Miles City failed entirely. Oh, we had to decide if we were to return home to England. Oh, you and wanted to go straight back home. But I was determined to stay. I would not be defeated. Home to me now was Montana. <laughs> I suppose you might say, I found my righteous cause, and I was ready to fight to the last ditch. Um, so we discussed um, ways in which we could stay. Ewan wanted to go to work for a Mr. Uh, Wallop in the Bighorn Mountains, but I wanted to stay on our own ranch, make a go of it on our own. So uh, after further uh, discussion, we, we came up with plan number two. We decided that we would take in wealthy boarders on our ranch and charge them a monthly rent. But it wasn't ultimately for the rent payment that we were interested in. We were trying to entice those boarders to invest in the economic potential of our ranch. <laughs> ah, so it was that we began to take in boarders one or two at a time, and we did continue with our polo pony business. And Ewan continued studying his Montana birds. You know, I was always looking for extra ways to, to make some income. Uh, in fact, one of the ways I discovered was through my garden. You see, despite the gumbo soils, the arid climate of eastern Montana, I was able to raise vast quantities of produce. 
I would load up my wagon quite early in the morning with hundreds of pounds of vegetables and set off across the prairie hawking my wares. They would take me to remote ranches and uh, even uh, check wagons on the, on the prairie. I went to railroad section houses. I even went into the town of Fallon where I sold my produce uh, to the cowboys at the saloon there. I would be gone most of the day, well into the evening. But on a good day, I could bring in as much as $5 just in one day. <laughs> well, as luck would have it, two of our boarders, uh, what were their names, Mr. Adams and Mr. Colley were amateur photographers. And they began to teach me the craft of photography. And through much trial and error and experimentation, I was able to master the basic techniques of photography. And little did I know it at the time, but photography was to become my most successful money-making scheme. And that was good because uh, none of the boarders invested in our ranch. And I do have to say that they caused much more anxiety than their remuneration could ever atone for. Oh, and, and furthermore, uh, our polo pony business failed ent almost entirely when most of the horses, uh, they died in the hold of the ship en route to England. It was a dreadful affair. The few that did survive were not well received by the Brits. They said they were too high-spirited. And... One woman refused to buy her horse when she found out the brand could not be removed. We did continue to raise horses throughout the years, but never to the extent that we had originally planned. And our financial timing uh, continued to plague us throughout the years. I mean, just when we got out of the horse business, the Boer War broke out in Africa. Why? Uh, the, the demand for horses was great. The value of a horse nearly tripled overnight. Yet we had just gotten, gotten out of the business of horses when we decided to try our hand at the cattle business when the biggest epidemic of black legs swept the entire portion of eastern Montana. <laughs> oh, and here's another example of, a, of our timing. We eventually did sell a horse to a... Uh, a wealthy gentleman in England, and it did survive the crossing. We were anxiously awaiting the arrival of that check when uh, the gentleman wired us. He'd, he told us he had just put the check in the mailbag on the ship, the Titanic. <laughs> you know, after years of trying... I realized we would never become wealthy um, ranching in Montana, but somehow we always managed to find ways to make ends meet. Uh, so now let me tell you a bit about, uh, about my photography. In those early years, my subjects were the birds, the wildlife of eastern Montana. But I realized quite early on that I had to develop more skills than just the technical ones, and the first one was that of patience. I uh, rode to a small lake north of Terry to photograph some wild swans that had been seen there, and I thought I was quite stealthy in my approach, but they flew off just as I arrived. I was able to read The Merchant of Venice in, in its entirety <laughs> while awaiting the return of those swans. <laughs> You see, I, I had to get uh, quite patient with my subjects, and, and I faced uh, challenges with uh, photographing the wildlife. You see, I had to get as close as I possibly could to my subjects in order to photograph them. I did not have specialty lenses. That meant that uh, I had to get as close as I could, whether it was a skittish antelope or, or a rattlesnake squo coiled ready to strike. I, I had to become quite agile in getting into just the right position to get my photograph. In fact, one time, I had spotted an eagle's area in the Badlands, and, and I found myself easing across a ledge in the Badlands with a precipice on either side, toting my photographic equipment to get close to that nest. 
In fact, I wanted to document those, those birds in the nest, so I went back on many different occasions. They grew quite accustomed to my presence. With one, I, I had to poke him with my tripod to get him to turn around and face the camera. <laughs> Another one, I threw a small stone at him. He nearly had a fit. You know, the last time I went back, I was able to pick them up with my bare hands and pose them. I do have to say that uh, sometimes, though, my lack of agility gave rise to some rather awkward positions. And Ida Archdale employed me to photograph her with her pet antelope. And, uh, well, I wrote up the incident uh, in an article that I, I, I sent to the country uh, life. It's a, it's a British magazine. This is, this is what I wrote. An attempt to photograph the beast nearly proved fatal to the camera as the antelope charged full at the tripod. In a courageous effort to save the instrument, the lady photographer behind it caught her foot in her skirt and fell over backwards. And the triumphant antelope was upon her in a moment. Fortunately, the buck's strength does not equal its pugnacity, and the recumbent photographer with great dexterity managed to hold the tripod in one hand while firmly grasping her assailant's horn with the other until released from this awkward position. <laughs> I packed a nine-pound camera, and as I said, I had to rely on my ability to handle, handle animals as well as, as people to get them to hold still long enough for the exposure of the negative. You see, my camera did not have an, ex uh, a, a, an adjustable shutter. That meant that I had to remove the lens cap, count the number of seconds I wanted the exposure of the negative, and then replace the lens cap. Sometimes it would be 20 to 40 seconds, depending on the lighting conditions and so forth. And if my subjects moved at all, it would result in a blurred picture. You can imagine how difficult that would be uh, with the constant prairie winds or children who continue, continually fidget. <laughs> so I traveled the area then as a photographer. I, I charged 25 cents for a photo or $5 for an album. I, w I was never a studio photographer. I always went to my subjects. In those early years, it was the cowboys roping and branding on the open range, breaking horses, pushing 3,000 head of horses across the Yellowstone River. I think some of my favorite subjects were the cowboys working for the XIT ranch, but equally fascinating were the old world types, the wolfers, the sheep herders. I I got to meet such a variety of people through my camera. In fact, one of my favorite subjects was a, a woman, a Mrs. Collins was her name. She, she was a feisty uh, pioneer woman from Ireland, and she ranched by herself along the, the Yellowstone River. Mrs. Collins would set up a, a cook tent in Fallon at the stockyards during shipping time once a year. She had quite a thriving business cooking for the, the cowboys then. She was a bit of a tippler when she got the blues. <laughs> but I did so enjoy her. I asked her one time if I could photograph her, and she had quite a time getting herself and her room ready. She couldn't find her gown, and she lost her false teeth. She thought her dog had gone off with them. <laughs> and then she asked me to go and borrow Mrs. Van Horn's teeth, which I did. <laughs> she, she had to take them out and wash them first. You know, uh, I took up photography as a means to pay our bills. But as time went by, I realized that there was much more to it than just that. It was a period of time that was transforming not just the land, but the people as well. It wasn't the rush of money and livestock into eastern Montana now that was changing it. It was the rush of people. Uh, first, it was the Italians. The, the Chinese men who built the railroads. Oh, and the railroads brought in the homesteaders. The Norwegians, the Germans, the Poles, but Bulgarians, Greeks, you can't imagine the ethnic differences that were in this country at that time. And 
they hired me to photograph them. I photographed their weddings and baptisms and burials. I photographed them at work and at play. <laughs> you know, um, I do have to say that um, I was a bit uncomfortable around my neighbors, excepting, of course, for our good friends, the Williams sisters. But the social differences were so great. Yet it was my camera that enabled me to, to mix and mingle with these people. My camera gave me a place, a purpose in my community during this time of such great change. I, I remember writing a letter, and, and I, I found it. I have it in here someplace. Um, I wrote a letter to my older brother, Percy. He was here uh, before the turn of the century. And I tried to describe to him what was happening. I believe the year was 1911. This is what I, I wrote to him. The great hunting days are now over, and the ranchmen and granger will see they never return. About all that is left of the sportsman today is to hunt with the camera. The prairie swarms with farmers who plow up the land with steam and gasoline engines. The only consolation we have is that they not, have not yet begun to plow up the badlands, <laughs> although someone may invent an effective contrivance even for this. <laughs> mm. You know, I realized if one was to survive in Montana, one had to adapt. And I learned, I learned uh, how to adapt quite early on. It was in my riding attire. You see, I realized that spending all day in the saddle, side saddle, where your, your horse would leap across a washout or up and down a steep draw, why? It was enough to convince any woman that change was indeed in order. Not only was it uncomfortable, it was unsafe as well. So I did something about it. I ordered from a catalog a, a split skirt. You see, a split skirt would enable a woman to ride astride, man fashion. Uh, I, I really believe that uh, it is the only way for a woman to ride a horse in Montana. Well, let me show you how it work, works. This has, I won't do all of the buttons. It has uh, two buttons. But you, you, when you're getting ready to ride, you simply remove this panel by unbuttoning the buttons, and then you have a split skirt. And when you have completed your ride, you simply put the ba panel back on, and you have a skirt in full enough fashion for the day, or so I thought. <laughs> I realize that change does not always come easily for people in eastern Montana. <laughs> Let me tell you my split skirt story. We were off to Miles City for a bit of a holiday. I mean, such events are not appreciated unless one is hard worked. I was so looking forward to it. And this is what happened when I rode into the streets of Miles City that day. I have, I have a, my diary entry. I made note of it in here. Now, first of all, you have to realize that Miles City grew up a rather rough town. It consisted of 42 saloons and female companionship readily available to the paying customer. And yet, well, this is what happened when I rode into town. My divided skirt attracted much attention, although my costume was so full as to look like an ordinary walking dress when the wearer was on foot. It created a bit of a sensation. So great at first was the prejudice against any divided garment in Montana for a woman to wear that a warning was given me to abstain from riding on the streets of Miles City, lest I might be arrested. I simply cannot believe that I was the most shocking sight to see on the streets of Miles City that day. <laughs> it is safety and long distances that determine fashion, which is why the divided skirt soon became the fashion of the day for ranch women in Montana, and even for the women in the, uh, 
proper town, a mile city. <laughs> well, let's see now. I have told you about how we've come to Montana and how we've stayed. And, oh, and about my fashion statement. I suppose I could tell you a little bit about life on the ranch, on Eve Ranch. You know, in those early years, we spent a considerable amount of time hunting. We would be gone as long as two to three months at a time. I really believe it is a wonderful way for a woman, uh, a couple, to develop comradeship if the woman has any propensity at all towards the outdoors. All sorts of cobwebs get blown away on the windswept prairies or the trails and gulches of the Badlands. I really believe there is no life more congenial than that of the saddle and rifle. And as a result of those, those hunting trips, we did acquire some rather unusual pets. Uh, it was after I shot the bear that I realized it was a she-bear and it had two cubs, so I took it home and raised it on condensed milk. We eventually sent it off to the London Zoo. And a wolfer appeared one day and, and presented us with two wolf pups. We did grow rather fond of those pups. Tessa and Wee Charpy, we named them. They're Sioux Indian names. But Ewan didn't like the way that they roughhoused with me uh, as they got older, so we shipped them off to the Coney Island Zoo in New York. But all in all, I mean, the uh, life on the ranch was that of, of work. I mean, there were the animals to tend to, the chickens to feed and butcher, and corrals to clean out, and, and uh, my garden to tend to, and to harvest, and the food to put up, and the household chores. I think, though, the chore that I found the most irksome was that of wash day, particularly in the wintertime. I mean, Montana winters proved to be rather challenging. I, I remember one particularly cold day, and I, I had poured the boiling water into my wash pan, and it filled the entire room with steam. You couldn't even see the back walls, and, it, and everything in the room frosted, and my clothes froze to the pan. We heated our, our uh, place with wood or coal. I would dig the coal, soft coal, from the hillside behind our, play, our, our house. One winter, I, I kept track, of course, how much uh, coal that I burned. I burned as much as 100 pounds of day, uh, per day one particular winter. And I worried so about the animals in the barn uh, one winter. It was at least 30 below zero. It seemed like weeks on end. So I devised a concoction of water and flour and manure that I stirred up on the, on the cook stove. And then I went out to the barn and I, I cocked between the logs to protect the animals from the bitter wind that was raging at the time. You know, living in isolated areas, one had to become resourceful. I mean, I was my own veterinarian and, and uh, my own doctor. I, I had to, uh, to, to perform... Um, autopsies if things went wrong, and, and do diagnosis on animals that were sick. Sometimes, of course, administer medicines. I had to become my own medical doctor as well. I mean, when confronted with an emergency, you had to deal with it immediately. And I remember one time, I had a particularly bad toothache. It became quite painful. Uh, and I knew I had to do something about it. So I got up rather early that day, and I, I went and milked the cow and turned him out. And then I found a wire, and I went out to the barn, and I, I tied one end of the wire around a rope, which I threw it over the rafter of the barn, and then I tied the other wire quite securely around my tooth. And I stepped up on a trunk and let myself down easily, and it got the tooth out. A bit of the crown uh, root was still in there. I, I, I got it out. It... Uh, I remember it bled a great deal, but the, the relief was immense. I remember getting breakfast quite merrily. <laughs> you know, I'm often asked, whatever did you do for entertainment? And as I said, it was quite rare. I do consider reading a form of entertainment and one of life's greatest pleasures. In fact, I devised a way where I could churn butter and read at the same time. Oh, and if we had guests, uh, overnight guests that came to the ranch and they could play a musical instrument, whether it was a piano or a, a banjo or... I remember one time a man was a rather good whistler. 
Well, you can rest assured they were uh, engaged for entertainment for the evening. Oh, and the, the cowboys taught us how to play poker. I did so enjoy a good hand of poker. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been living alone on the ranch now for 13 years. Losing you into death was, was the great sadness of my life. Thinking it would sever our ties, I, I, I found a bundle of, of his letters and I, I burned them. And, and then I, I danced alone to music of our old Vic Crowla. Oh, I know that first winter I could have found companionship. But as Ewan used to tell me, I'm a rum old codger. <laughs> that I do infinitely prefer and enjoy living alone. You know, I remember, oh, I think the year was 1918, a young railroad man proposed to me. I thought he was joshing. I told him I was old enough to be his mother, and of course I declined. And <laughs> I do know that he was much more enamored with Eve Ranch than he was with me. 1918 brings back a, a, a fond memory, not that I received a marriage proposal, but that was the year that I became a U.S. citizen. And I was determined to vote in that first election. It was, it was just a local school election. But I rode my horse into the town of Fallon, despite a bit of a blizzard. Um, oh, and I remember I, I went into the uh, schoolhouse and I had to wear a scarf around my uh, face to protect myself from the influenza that was raging at the time. But I cast my vote for honesty and integrity. I'm living quite alone now, but I do have plenty of occupation. I have my books to read and my photography, my animals to tend to. I have no time to be lonely. And I, I see no need to hire any help. And as long as I can throw a leg over a saddle, I shall never own a motorized vehicle. <laughs> I think living alone is quite agreeable. There are no annoyances, no dissensions from others. In fact, lately I've been thinking that all past misery is being repaid by present contentment. Lately I've been feeling my, my age, but I, I know I shan't be around that much longer, but I look at death as a delightful journey that I shall take when all my tasks are completed. You know, when I was, uh, when I was age, age 25 or so, I remember write, writing in my diary I wish I could lead a life worthy to look back upon, for I am far out of the path now. Well, I suppose in some small way I've accomplished that goal, but in no small task for being far out of the path. Well, I, I really have talked long enough. I, I have to get going and, and do the chores. Why don't you come along with me and pitch some hay to the horses? Feed the chickens. After all, those are the tonics that will make you realize that the world is not such a bad place after all. <laughs>